of the type of training that I do. It goes much more beyond sit, stay, lay down. Um, so there's a lot of science behind it. And I'm here to answer any questions that, that you need. So uh, I am Vanna Darnell. Um, my maiden name is Cabral. I grew up in Kalinga. And um, I was involved in FFA in high school. So I've always wanted to be around animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian when I um, was younger. Uh, I went to Wessex College. I studied um, agriculture. I graduated with a um, AS associate's degree. After that, I moved to Indiana. Um, I had gotten married and I moved to Indiana. Um, I met my first husband through Wessels College and his family had farmland in Indiana. So after we were married, we moved back there um, to farm the land and I was close enough to Purdue, so I attended Purdue University. I, never, I didn't graduate college with a bachelor's at Purdue University. Um, I had the opportunity to work as a vet tech um, for a clinic in Indiana. So I, worked, I was a veterinarian technician for 10 years. Um, after that, I decided that I had young kids and I wanted to um, be able to be flexible for the kids. So I went to grooming school and I graduated um, from dog grooming school, pet grooming school. Um, so I moved back to Kalinga and I opened up Kalinga Pet Grooming. My dog training background is I first um, started a lesson here at West Hills College. It was a herding dog lesson, and that really sparked my interest. It was a lot of fun doing that. Um, when I lived in Indiana, I attended, I attended many types of classes. And um, we attended one class. I had border collies at the time. And I just, my border collie, I just had, my last one just had to be put to sleep not too long ago. But we tried fly ball, and if anyone knows what fly ball is, it's uh, kind of like a relay. Um, a dog waits behind a line, and then he runs down, hits a platform, a, a ball bounces up, and then he runs it back. And then other dogs do the same thing. However, fly ball was not for us because my border collie wanted to take everybody's ball and um, did not want to share it. It was really embarrassing, so we had to leave early. We didn't even complete the first class. Uh, I briefly worked for a canine protection company, and briefly, I mean less than a couple weeks, I didn't like their method of training. So, um, I taught private and in-house obedience classes through Kalinga Pet Grooming. Um, I had attended so many classes that I developed uh, a knack, and I like working with dogs, so it was very easy for me to pick up and understand what the dogs were uh, about to kind of help them. I was a Kalinga 4-H leader here and I taught obedience classes to the uh, members of Kalinga 4-H and they competed in competitions. And I also taught classes um, at Kalinga Parks and Kalinga here on Parks and Recreation. And this was a long time ago. So this was um, probably 10 years ago or plus or more. More than 22. Okay, so <laughs> it, it's been a minute. Um, I went to work at Pleasant Valley State um, Prison in 2007. Um, in 2019, Scott Fraunheim was the warden. And we approached him with a dog program. Many of the prisons around the state have dog programs. And so um, he said, go ahead and go with it. And um, I led that effort. I reached out to other institutions and found which dog program I wanted to have and I reached out to that organization and they're based out of San Luis Obispo called New Life Canines. And um, the dogs at New Life Canines are taught to be service animals for veterans and first responders with PTSD. So the inmates um, teach the dogs during the week and then the dogs go home with um, citizens, correctional officers, so that the dogs can get real life experiences out in public. Um, I decided to be a puppy raiser, and so did Bree, my daughter Bree, sorry I didn't inter introduce her, and we each had a dog. I had Finn, and he was a chocolate Labrador, and Bree um, had Rome, which was a Labradoodle. And last month, Rome was placed um, with the recipient, and so he's doing that transition right now. So Finn was born in 2019, and he was uh, uh, an amazing um, 
prospect to be a service dog uh, for a veteran and first responder. And then when we went down on COVID, a lot of the dogs didn't get what they needed because they were locked down in prison. So um, he started having struggles. And some of the struggles were um, a little bit violent. I mean, Bree got bit um, pretty bad and my husband got bit pretty bad and we couldn't pinpoint what was causing his struggles. So he was sent to Jennifer Arnold in Georgia and she has um, a service dog, canine assistance, and she also um, writes books. He was actually put to sleep in December of um, 2020, uh, 2020, the typo, um, because he had a neurological disorder um, that was untreatable. And so Jennifer Arnold's husband is a veterinarian and she works with many worldwide trainers around and she had all the access to um, find out what was going on with him. So Finn's the reason why I began searching for a canine training program. So um, Finn is my why. Everybody has a why. Why do you, why do you get a dog? Uh, because it's cute, because I need a companion, because I need um, the dog to, to work some sheep. So everybody has that why. Um, but then is my why for learning more about concept-based training. So um, I love dogs. I love their companionship. Um, part of me feels like I failed Finn, that maybe I could have done something different. Maybe I could have helped him. Even though he had a neurological disorder, it still felt like I failed him in some sort of fashion. So. Um, New Life Canines has a psychologist on hand who helps the inmate handlers when they transition, when a dog transitions to a recipient, the psychologist steps in to provide um, mental health and rehabilitation because that's all the dog, that's all the inmates know. So I talked to the um, psychologist myself because I was having a hard time and um, she helped me decide to turn that struggle into a strength. So, um, I didn't. I don't want anyone to have uh, a dog that they have struggles with. And so I looked and I found a um, training company um, out of the UK called Absolute Dogs. So since we're in the museum, I thought we'd do a little bit of history about dog training. So um, origin used to be like a cruel system. Um, we still have those methods today where um, it's punishment. You punish the dog to get the result that you want. Um, we started moving towards more positive training, and it's it's becoming a little bit more popular now. There's still some methodologies that are still towards the punishment aspect, but um, you can see more of a science-based training to um, help with the dog training, and it helps develop their, their brain. So, uh, the first study for the birth of animal psychology was done by um, Oscar Funks, Funks, and he there was a horse that um, was math solving, so he would count. So, in looking more into it, he realized that the the horse was going off with the cues of the owner, the trainer. So the trainer was off offering cues. He's tired. <laughs> Um, so this presented evidence that animals could be trained through experiences. Pavlov, he um, he is conditional. He does uh, more of a conditional. Um, it'll come to me. Anyways, he researched and he conducted experience, experiences on the digestive system. So if a dog, you give a dog a bowl, the dog starts drooling that was an indicator. So he, he used a tuning fork, which was a neutral stimulus to the dog. The dog didn't start drooling with the tuning fork. He drooled with the bowl, but not the tuning fork. So then he started introducing the tuning fork with the bowl, and the dog started drooling, because the dog has started associating the tuning fork with the bowl. After that, he can associate the tuning fork and the dog would start drooling. So it was just a kind of a progression of how um, dogs could be su successfully conditioned. So this is counter-conditioning, that's the word I was looking for. So dogs could be counter-conditioned to 
um, drill out a sound of the bell. If you hit a bell and feed your dog, then your dog knows, oh, every time that bell gets hit, then their dog is going to eat. So, Skinner. Skinner is another um, person who's conducted a lot of um, science and experiences. So the way he did this is he created a box and underneath is an electrical um, grid and there's a lever. So um, he would key the, the, the rat to hit the lever and food would dispense. And if the rat did not hit the lever, then he would zap them. So that was a form of a punishing training. So in types of reinforcement, and I work in this realm right here, um, you're going to give positive reinforcement. And then if you give a positive reinforcement, there's also a, a negative um, punishment. So what that means is if a dog is um, wanting to lay on this, like if Raven was wanting to lay on the bed and I didn't want her to lay on the bed, then I would just pick the bed up or I would remove that from, from it. So that's the negative punishment, because she wants the bed, but I don't want her on the bed, so I pick it up. So I may feed her on the bed, and then when I want her to go um, sit over here, and she doesn't want to do that, she wants to sit her, I would just pick it up. So that's negative punishment. It's not um, abusive um, to do that. It, it's just because she, the dog wants to do it, and you don't want the dog to do it, so you can remove that out of the picture. Negative reinforcement is when the man wants the dog to go for a walk and the dog is like taking off running and then he um, yells at him, he hits him, he does something. That breaks the relationship between owner and dog. This builds relationships. Even though that this is a negative punishment, you're not um, physically hurting the dog. You're just taking something the dog away, wants away. Do you, do you have any questions so far? So there's modern training methodologies. Um, balanced dog trainers use um, treats or toys or clickers and then training collars. So they try the food, they try another method, and if they don't get it, then they use um, retraining, training collars, electric collars, prongs, choke chains, things like that. Um, positive dog trainers um, only rely on positive reinforcement to train dogs and attempt to resolve behavior problems. So if a dog is lunging at another dog that you're walking on the street, they're going to try to use a positive like clicker or food or something, but the dog's arousal level is too high that you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, dominance or pack um, leader trainers, a lot, of them, a lot of people think that there's an alpha system but science proves that there's not an alpha system. In, a, in a dogs, you have um, a dog that's more stronger than the other dogs, but that's not an alpha system. It's like a pecking order, and that's pecking order came from chickens. Behavior adjustment training um, is force-free, uh, based around uh, systemic desensitization and closely monitoring your dog's body language and reactions in order to avoid flooding. And flooding is when you um, have your dog and you just throw things at the dog and, and his brain and he doesn't know what to do. So um, he's just overwhelmed and anxious over what's going on. I do the science-based training where I look at what's going on with the dog, the behavior, what's causing that struggle so that I can identify where we need to fix that struggle. So if a dog is lunging, barking at other dogs, what other history can I gather to determine what's causing that dog to react and bark and lunge at the other dog? It could be, some people think that it's aggression, but it could be the dog is scared and he doesn't know what to do with himself. Um, sometimes the dogs are, um, so engaged in something that they don't know how to like back away from it. Um, so we look at the science. I look at the science part of what's going on in their brain in order to fix it. Mirror training is basically do as I do style training where a handler tries to get their dog to copy them. That's what um, Jennifer Arnold is good for that. 
it works for her. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, the first round of dogs, um, Finn and Rowan, were taught firstly with her method where the handlers would go and, and um, flip the light on and then say, do you like me? And then the dog would like kind of like try to flip the light on and they'd reward and they'd treat. Um, like I said, it does work in some incidences, but dog training isn't a linear thing. Not every dog is going to learn the same way just like kids but So you have to adapt to the dog in front of you. I just, uh, if this isn't appropriate now, that you, no, no. you can skip it. Uh, do you find that certain breeds are really good at uh, learning and other breeds are not so good? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of dogs that are intelligent dogs, not that, not to say that other dogs are not intelligent dogs. Most dogs don't think French Bulldogs are intelligent, but they pretty are. Um, it's easier to train them. The dogs that are not as quick to pick up what you're trying to teach them, you have to figure out what works for them. So some dogs are motivated by toys, some are not, some have um, other issues going on in their head where it's kind of hard for them to grasp what you're, what you're asking for them to do. So what I do is I look at the dog and try one thing, and if that doesn't work, I have a couple other things that we can try that accomplishes the same thing. But yes, there are some dogs that pick it up a lot easier than others, and so that's the reason why I brought um, Raven today. I've only had her for three weeks, and she's a puppy. So I didn't do anything with her at first, um, just so that I could come and give you a fresh, fresh dog, kind of like how we start. And she likes her bed, and that's one of the things we teach dogs. She, but I didn't have to teach her that. She just likes her bed. And I take her to work with me at the prison, and I just put her bed down, and she spends the day in her bed unless I walk off, and then she'll follow me. Um, so that, that's mirror training, do as I do. So this is the, the motto for, um, for absolute dogs and the pro dog trainer. To the owners that see struggles and turn them into strengths. The solution seekers, the optimi optimism bringers, the owners that never accept a relationship and a dog is lost. To the game players, the fun makers, and the joy finders, the owners who inspire rather than force or deprive, to those who, who, when faced with a struggle, scream, there's a game for that, who reach out and grab real life results and never, never stop transforming through games. So, concept training. This is concept training explained. And I'll go back to um, the previous slide to give you an idea. But concept training is beneath every behavior is a feeling. So beneath every dog's action, there's something going on. And beneath every feeling is a need. So we have to fill that need. We have to fix that need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause, not the symptom. So the symptom is dogs that are, are aggressive, lunging, chasing cars, um, uh, doing, let's see, what do I have? Um, I'm working with um, clients that um, their dogs kill livestock. That's the symptom of whatever is going on in their head. So as a games-based concept trainer, I look at what they're missing in their head and we build that. So it's called brain shaping. Um, these are all things that we want. We want the dog to have self-control so if he sees that, that dog walking down the street or if he sees that goat, that he has enough self-control not to engage with that goat. We want your dog to focus on you. Um, we want them to be calm, um, grit. We want them to, if they're struggling with something, we want them to be able to, to persevere and go forward, um, be flexible. So this is how the skill your dog, how skilled your dog with any specific concept influences the choices they make. So if they're if they're optimistic, they're going to make good choices. If they're pessimistic, they're going to make bad choices. So what I do is concepts in dogs' brains can be shaped and molded. So if you have a dog that exhibits negative behaviors, I can change that. I can show you how to change it into positive behaviors. We hold the key to the individual concepts that our dogs need. Concept trainers don't focus on the outcome, so we don't focus on what 
the lunging or the aggressive activities is. We focus on what can we do to fix that outcome? What can we build concept-wise? Um, how do we do it? Play um, games to shape the concepts. So the training that I provide is games. It's game-based. It's not a command, sit and stay. You add the verbal cue after, but it is done by um, playing games. If you want your dog to be in proximity of you, you play games to encourage them to come back to you. And it takes three minutes, three minutes, a few times a day, a couple minutes, a couple times a day. It's not where you have to delegate, oh, this is training session, and we do it. This is just something that you just do um, casually. So there are some concepts that are most useful when it comes to training your dog. Calmness. Calmness is key. If you have a dog that is over aroused all the time, they're not going to be um, at that level where they can learn something new. So we want some form of calmness in the dog in order to teach the dog. So right now she's calm and her arousal level is low. Independence helps the dog be happy and calm. It's really good with separation behaviors. Um, so that they can be left alone. Um, she's not very independent because if I walk down there and I turn the corner, she's going to wonder where I'm at and she's going to come follow me or go look for me. So she's not very independent. And then when I leave the house and then she doesn't go, uh, she screams and hollers and barks and things like that. So she needs to work on independence. She needs the confidence and optimism. If they see something new, it doesn't, it's nothing. It's, if they see a balloon fly off and they've never saw a balloon fly off, it's none of their business. That's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for no reaction um, so that you can take them in any situation and it's a positive, confident, optimistic situation so that they make good choices. Flexibility um, creates confidence when routine or environment changes. So. If you have to take your dog to the vet and he's a little bit um, scared of the vet, flexibility and optimism will help grow your dog so it, the dog is go with the flow type attitude. Grit, it builds the determination and staying power. Um, we'll, work, we'll have the dog work a little bit harder. Um, if you're wanting your dog to um, jump up on a table and they're not getting the concept of jumping up on the table. Grit is where they want to continue doing it until they master it. Proximity. Um, everybody wants their dog not to run away and stay close. Um, so we teach proximity games so that the dog finds value in you instead of in the environment. Focus. You want them to be focused on you and not focused on the livestock or as any other people, the other dogs running around, um, children, balls, or anything like that. My border collie did not have any focus when it came to, to balls at all. Self-control. They may want to go do something, but they have to have the control to know that, yes, you, I, I want to go do it, but I can't go do it. So they're not testing you in that in that. Uh, area. So they want to look for permission before they go and do it. We train, I train for the situation, I don't train in the situation. So we do a lot of training outside of whatever the triggers are so we can build their confidence and their concepts in a safe environment. If you go outside and your dog, you know your dog's going to be lunging at every single dog it passes, then um, you're not going to ever fix that issue. You're going to get frustrated and then you know you could result to yelling at your dog, um, choking, not choking, but pulling on the leash. So um, we don't train in that situation because if their arousal level is up here, then they're not going to learn anything. Their arousal level needs to be at a, a straight level so that they can learn something. So how dogs perceive events. So there's an event that happens and the dog has a perception. Ask, am I aware? Yes or no? Um, if it's yes, 
is it important? Yes or no? And if it's yes, it goes to, is it good or bad? So dogs, that process goes through their head. If it's bad, they may exhibit a behavior of barking, lunging, aggressive, aggression, pulling on leash, and loss of focus, which adds to their bucket. Every dog has a bucket. We all have buckets. Um, when we're having bad days or a bad week, everything fills into that bucket until you're like, I can't do this anymore. Dogs have the same bucket. Little things fill into their bucket that's negative, and then they can't take it anymore, and then you may get a, a negative reaction. So what we aim for is if there's an event, a perception is, am I aware, is it important, is it good, good or bad? If they have an optimistic um, response, it's going to be like, if they're going to ignore it, uh, they're going to stay focused, um, they're going to listen to you, and they're going to listen to whatever prompts. And what that does is that empties the bucket. So you have negative filling the bucket, and you have, can you go to the next slide? Oh, not that one. Okay, so, um, so you have all the stuff paying into the bucket. It takes 72 hours of just calmness and um, peace in their brain for it to empty. And by using calming techniques, you can help empty that bucket much quicker. So giving them personal space, giving them something to chew on will help. Um, and so the bucket has a hole, it's just a visual. The bucket has a hole so it drains out. Um, some rescue dogs will take um, three, to take three days, three weeks, and three months to, to get past whatever they've experienced previously. So it's like a bank account. You have positive, um, in, positive interactions paying in, and then you have negative action, uh, negative actions. So the positive is what you're aiming for, and the negative is something that you want to avoid. So by using um, concept-based um, training, you're you're increasing their ability to be more positive than negative. So um, what I do is I do a behavior consultation. It's a form that the clients fill out. It goes into detail, breed, sex, um, how many uh, puppies were in the litter, any type of history if it's a rescue dog. And then I ask multiple questions on how, um, what the dog-to-dog -dog interaction is and things like that. So that way, I um, am able to, this is my question, it's like 10 pages. So that way I'm able to determine what could possibly be going on with the dog that we need to fix. I also speak with the client and go over and I ask additional questions. And then that way I can find out what the client is, what they want in their dog and what's causing the issues so that we can develop a plan on how we're going to succeed and build that relationship so that the client and the dog have, um, are living in a happy relationship without any conflict. So, um, I took a class, um, it was a long class, it's called a GEEK program, that I had to take a, a test and I passed, and that's more of the behavior aspect. Why does the dog think the way it does and what can we do to fix it? So I determine what kinds of games that we can play with the dog. Again, the dogs are three minutes long at the most. Um, you can play multiple games within that period of time and then be done with it. So it can happen anywhere, anytime or anywhere. So you can do it while you're getting dressed in the morning. You can play a, a couple games while you're eating. You can play a couple games while you're sitting on the couch watching TV. So um, it, it's not where you have to set time aside. It allows you to reshape your dog's brain in a positive way so we can take the positive and remove the negative. So, do you have any questions? Yes. Okay, so uh, well, I actually have a, a, a dog that is, uh, we raised him from a pup. And uh, of all of his siblings, he, he's the most reactive. Okay. And he's almost nine now. Um, what do you, uh, so I, things I've, I've come across say, well, sometimes it's, you didn't socialize them enough. So I'd like you to talk about socialization and what, what that means to you and, and how you do it. Um, 
Some people think that they need to take their dogs to dog parks to socialize them. But um, socializing isn't necessarily good in that atmosphere. As puppies, when puppies are in utero, depending on what the mom, how the mom feels, if she's in a stressful environment, if she's in a good environment, that translates into the puppies. Mm. And then as the little puppies are growing, um, as the litter, they have different levels of um, play and socialization. And if some dogs are picking on, some puppies are picking on one dog, then that dog may be a little bit more reactive or could um, diminish their confidence and their optimism. So it actually starts at conception um, for a lot of dogs. Um, so we look back at what's going on with the mom. Um, after that, any, it's critical because between four weeks old, actually birth to um, 12, 14 weeks, if they have a bad experience, bad experience in any way, shape, or form, or if they perceive it as a bad experience, then that can make them more reactive. Lack of confidence, um, lack of, lack of um, optimism, all those things can build in. So when I do my consultation, I look at that history. Some people know, some people don't and find out what was going on. If it's the rent of the litter, then they may have a little bit more struggle being confident. Um, taking dogs to dog parks, a lot of people think that they, you need to put your dog in that situation so they can get along with other dogs, but depending on how your dog perceives that dog park depends on how they're going to react. So um, it may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, depending on what's going on in their head and the body language. Yeah, well, they never, they never really define what socialization means. They just say, oh, you should socialize your dog. So, um, yeah. Um, there's, his siblings, two of his siblings got parvo, and they were away for about 10 days to two weeks. So he was on his own. Mm -hmm. Then they came back. But he's, he was much more uh, reactive. And like if we, well, bicycles, skateboards, mm -hmm. anything that surprises him, he mm -hmm. just goes nuts. Yeah. It sounds like, without discussing it in detail, sounds like he has a confidence issue. Probably. And so he's exhibiting that reactive behavior because he's not confident. He's not optimistic I believe to it. where he... Um, where it doesn't bother him. So mm -hmm. he's a little bit, he's probably a little bit fearful and those are just something that he just is afraid of. Okay. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, no, I think it, I think it makes sense. Um, but it's so funny because we'll have people come over uh, and, and spend the night and he gets to you. He gets used to them, and then if they leave the room and they come back in the room, it's almost like a new experience, mm -hmm. and and he gets upset again. Yeah, it is a new experience in his head. Every time they walk out, out they come back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, socialization—that's a term that um, is is thrown out there, but a lot of people or science doesn't. It's thrown out there. And everybody thinks, oh, I need to socialize my dog. Mm -hmm. you don't have to, we don't have to socialize our dogs. As long as they um, have all the concepts and they're strong on those concepts, then they can go out and they can socialize and they're not going to have an issue. Okay. Because they're going to be um, confident, they're going to be optimistic, they're uh, going to be able to have self-control, um, they're going to be paying attention to you and, and that other environment's going to be none of their business. So. Yeah. I agree. Yes. What What would you say? When does a puppy stop being a puppy? When should I got a a big dog? Mm -hmm. And it's probably thirteen months old now. Oh yeah. And she's big. Mm -hmm. And she constantly, all she wants to do is play, play, play. Attention. She's always licking. She wants to get on your lap. She wants to. She's a pain in the butt sometimes. Yeah, uh, no, I understand. Uh, and uh, 
Of course, she knocked my wife down twice, oh, no. not being aggressive, just overly playing. playful. Yeah. You know, and uh, well, you can't have that, but no. I, you know, so we have to walk around with a stick. Yeah. And she'll run and jump and shoot. Grab your and just anything to get your attention. You what know? kind of dog is she? Because breed has a lot to do with. Okay, she's a uh, bull mastiff. That she's not oh, a pedigree. Nice. She's not a pedigree. Yeah. She's yeah. mixed, but she's yeah. got a. Yeah, she probably doesn't realize how big she is. No, she's long legged and mm -hmm. she's friendly. She just she loves she's everybody. She's just happy. But she, she has just no self control. In the butt, you know? Yeah, she has no no self control, no, no, self -control, no impulse control. That's. That's probably what's going on. So dogs are puppies, like she's still a puppy because she's not six months old yet. Once they hit about six to eight months old, they go into that teenage naughty stage. And it could be, depending on the breed, up to their three years old. So, um, you know, trying to test the world, trying to um, see what they can get away with, that's what she's in that age right now. So this is really a critical age for her to, to learn and uh, be reshaped into a, a more calmer dog and um, that will help her in the long run because right now she's just, she's a she, doesn't dog, have off, you know? she doesn't have an off button. She's over aroused, she can't disengage. Um, so I can help you with that to kind of give you some ideas on what you can do to, to lower her arousal. Does she, does she, is she crate, crate, crate trained? Does she yeah. what? Crate trained. She's not. She's a ranch dog. Open range. Oh, okay. Dog. Okay. Yeah, she's a ranch, we, no, we, but she just loves everybody. Yeah. And she just. We could definitely, <laughs> I could definitely. Pardon me? Oh, I can definitely help you. Oh, okay. I'll uh, give good. you some we, ideas which can we, we want to keep the dog. We love her. She has so much personality. Right. But you don't want her hurting you. Yeah. No. Yeah. That you know, my wife, she knocked her down. Yeah. Hurt her. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We but, uh, we don't want that happening, especially with her size and stuff. But she's in that adolescent stage where she's just trying to test the waters and be naughty. She's a teenager. That's what she is. She's a teenager. I carry a stick to keep her away from me, mm -hmm. but I pet her when I go outside. Her pretty dog, she goes with me, and now I tell her no, and she comes to mine. Yeah. But I wave the stick to her, and she runs, runs fast as she could because she wants to play. Yeah, that stick may be her signal that it's play. She doesn't. She's not taking that stick as um, as something that's a negative thing. She's lo probably looking at, looking at that stick like, oh, you want to play with her. So that's, that's yeah, you don't, she, she thinks you're playing. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. you, and she's so fast you can't. So one of the things that if a dog has the opportunity to rehearse a negative behavior, that becomes the behavior. So if you practice positive behaviors, and ask for positive behaviors all the time, that becomes the habit. But if they're doing naughty things, if they're a naughty but nice dog, um, then that becomes the behavior. But we can reshape that behavior into a positive behavior. So um, I, have a, I had a dog that used to bark all the time, but that was his habit. He knew, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna bark all the time. But slowly, over a period of time, I'm reshaping that behavior so that he's not associating this area with where he can bark. So, she's not lost. I mean, we can definitely help her to keep you both safe um, so that she doesn't knock you down and hurt you. I think she knows already, but I said no, she, she doesn't jump on me. That's anymore. good. But Except when you're not looking. Oh. <laughs> She's going to take an opportunity, definitely, to, to take advantage. But so I not my stick no, no. back, she, she's not going to jump me from the back, you know? Yeah. So I'm still not, I don't trust her yet, but I just, she's learning. She knows me, you know. Yeah. She knows what no means is. Yeah, you have to protect yourself. 
you know, she doesn't have a mean bone, but you definitely need to protect yourself in, in that environment. So. so I have a question about barking. Okay. Um, so uh, fortunately my dog doesn't, doesn't bark. I don't want the barking problem, but she only barks at like cats and skunks. Is that just a personality thing? She may not really know what it is. What kind of dog do you have? Well, she was a stray. She's mostly a queen. Woman, so. Okay. So she has that prey drive in her. It's already ingrained because of her breed. Um, so she could look at them as the, the prey, I guess you can say. Uh -huh. um, if you don't want her barking at the cats and the skunks, then um, you can do like a disengagement game. It's called distract, mark, and treat. So, for example, if if they see the cat, if she sees the cat, and she's once she is like focused on that cat, you have lost your ability at that point in time until you build it up. So, distract, mark, and treat is say a, a, a word like I use nice and then I follow it up with a treat oh. nice and I follow it up with a treat and there's some there's some time frame between it okay. so my dogs associate nice with that treat when the doorbell when um, packages come to the house or someone's at the doorbell it will automatically chime and so they used to run to the front door to bark at whatever is right. out there but now I just say nice and then they run back to me for treats so now, now they're not going to the front door uh -huh. and barking at the, the door but you can use that distract mark and treat for anything you can mm -hmm. use it for people you can use it for animals um, but it's something that you would just build up so they know that that word matches something positive right right okay thanks mm -hmm. i have a question about growling which my dog talks but it, but it's growling mm -hmm. I, I've had my, my previous rat terrier, or she growled, that meant, you know, I don't like little kids or, or something, but to, to my current dog, it's, she just growls, she growls and she brings you a toy, she mm -hmm. let, she's never growled aggressively, but it is a bit of a problem if I take her somewhere because she'll be growling and other people feel uneasy. Or, or she talks smack to the big dogs, <laughs> and then the big dogs are going to get her, and, yeah. and, and I'm, of course, going to protect her and get bit. Right. Um, but is growling always bad? Or, I mean, it, it, no. it's a vocalization with her, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't, I've never punished her for it because she happy growls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, you can teach, use the DMT for that. Uh -huh. um, with, you would give whatever cue word you want to want to use, and I always use a different. I use a different one. I don't use good because you use good in your vocabulary all the time. So I use nice. So you're going to want to do the keyword and then treat her. Keyword treat her. Keyword treat her. Then when you're out in public, once she's once she's in that mode where she knows that that word equals a treat, when you're out in public, you should be able to just say that word and treat her. So you, she can play with the doll here, but when she's out in public, then you can use the other word. Because there's chances that her, her growling are meaning two different things. Okay. At home it's one thing, but then when she goes out in public, it could be the other dog or, or people. The other dogs don't seem to react to her negatively like she's, um, like she's threatening to mm -hmm. them. Um, but. It is sort of, I, I don't like her doing it because I'm mm -hmm. afraid the big dog's going to just turn around and grab right. her. And right. So just teach her that distract, mark, and treat, uh -huh. and then use it when you need to use it. In the house, don't, you don't have to use it. So, but when you go out, then you, know, you could use it. Any other questions? So Oh, I was just going to comment that was interesting what you said about the rescue dogs because it is interesting to get them and you don't know what they've been through mm -hmm. and that one of mine was very traumatized and, and still to this day, you know, you, you just can't raise your hand and, I, you know, you, and others seem to come, come around. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, sometimes that they, they, whatever experiences that they've had um, prior to that, um, whatever experiences that they have in the kennel, because it's a high stress environment and the bucket gets really full, um, develops how they're going to react. Um, so, someone had posted on Facebook today that her dog has anxiety because it was beaten. Mm -hmm. The dog, the chances are the dog does not have anxiety because it was beaten. The dog has anxiety for other reasons, but you think that since it's a rescue that it's been beaten. So um, it could be a, no, a number of different causes that cause that reaction other than thinking that all rescue dogs who have anxiety have been beaten. What's your uh, take on Caesar Milan's approach about the uh, leader of the pack and so forth? Yeah, um, his approach isn't good um, because he instills, I'm not going to say that across the board. I mean, he, he's, he's, you can see the transformations he's done. Um, but he uses sometimes a little bit more um, adversive methods to gain what he wants, like kicking them and, and like elbowing them just to get their attention and stuff. I don't have to do that to accomplish what I want. Well, no, I think, well, what I meant was his, uh, his approach seems to be domination. Yes, and absolutely. So, um, it doesn't necessarily sound bad because you really do want to uh, have control over your dog. So I just wondered what your... Right, you know. yeah. We don't have to have, in this training, you're working as a relationship with your dog. Uh, so your dog does things because... It makes you happy. Well, if you have a lot of dogs at home. I have like, a lot of dogs. <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, no, if you have a lot of dogs at home, um, the, the interaction between them, mm -hmm. for instance, the, our problem dog is not the first one that starts barking when the mailman comes. Mm -hmm. But his brother barks, and then that gets him riled up. Right. So it, right. It, I would think it's it, more, more difficult to train them when there's other dogs around. Yeah, when you first start off, it's um, good to teach them separately. Sure. And then you could teach them all together. Like if you have a boundary, your dog knows how to go on that boundary and stay on that boundary, then you could call one dog off, do whatever you need to do, and then put them back on. Hop up, hop up or break. Mm -hmm. And then that way you can teach whatever dog you're working with at that time. So it teaches them impulse control and um, flexibility so they just stay on their boundary. Okay. So it's, it's, it goes into the science portion of what's making them tick and what's making them react. I have a little Chewini and she's the leading of, she's the leader of the barking in the house. So when she starts barking, all the other dogs think, oh, there's something to be worried about because the little one's barking. So all the other dogs understand that whole nice concept but her. So when all the dogs go to the front door to bark at the mailman, I say my word, they run back, she's still at the front door and then she's like, where did everybody go? And then she comes back and then I reward her. But um, she's not doing it as long and as often now. So we're making progress, but yeah, she's anything that sets her off, then all the other dogs think that they need to pitch into. There's so many ways to accomplish what you want and so many methods. Um, it's just, you have to pick what's right for you and for your, your what's gonna be easiest for you and what results that you're gonna get. This works for me, um, but it's not for everybody because a lot of people want that instant satisfaction. And this one, depending on your dog and, and, and how you do it, um, may take a little bit longer to get what you're accomplishing. But then again, you're reversing whatever is going on in their brain, too, into the positive that you want them to be in, the good headspace. Okay. Well, she's up now. Oh, she's actually waiting. How is that boring? Yeah. Oh, look. So, yeah. so she, um, all right, you So, 
I'm going to do like a little orientation game. What this does is it teaches her to come back to me. So I throw my little treat. Oh, she got to see it. Look, look right here. Now, keep in mind, I haven't really played with her at all because I wanted to keep her fresh. Sometimes you have to point it out. I probably shouldn't throw it that far. So that's a lesson is that, is that um, I threw it too far and she couldn't see it. So now I have to modify it to make it easy for her. So I, I rewarded her by, when she looked at me, by telling her she was good. I never heard of you. Good girl! What was that? They're not Masons. They're not Masons? I thought you said Masons. I'm just using her um, own dog food mm. and some treats. But when she looks back at me, I'm rewarding that with good girl so that she's doing it a little bit faster. So that's an orientation game. So she's orientating back to me, and I'm rewarding her by throwing it back out again. Come here, girl. Good girly. And this I have worked with her. I was just playing around. But I can teach her how to spin right and left by just using the, the tree. Oh, there you go. Good girl. And then the goal is just to use the, the little finger command. Good girl. And I'm using like small little kibbles. Hey then. So that's a right and left spin. Um, sometimes if you're walking and you need um, them to be at your side, you can guide them at your side. So um, right now you just play with the, the food. And then I start adding the verbal, like side, and I can be right side, and then I can do the left side, and then say left side, and then she'll she'll learn what I'm asking of her. But she's she's doing really good with staying on her boundary. Well, she's nice and warm, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm just rewarding her bed for her being on it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.